Welcome back, and you guys talking me into it. Um, I'm going to be installing this uh, Wideband O2 sensor into the Miata. And um, even though it's like way ahead of time, I don't have an ACU to take proper advantage of it. I'm still going to get some use out of it. Um, I, I can hook it up to my Wideband gauge that I, I installed. And uh, if you saw that video, you saw what that looks like. And uh, I can get an idea of just stock values, which might be useful, you know, just to kind of get a feeling for the stock values of where it sits at idle, where it sits, at, you know, doing different things, wide open throttle, you know, and cruise and all this type of stuff and kind of get an idea of where those values are so I can see it. I mean, I've read it, you know, um, online, the maps and stuff like that. Um, so I kind of have a concept, but uh, it's always it's always nice to just kind of feel it while you're driving and, and just be able to look at the gauge. So I'm going to put it in the naturally aspirated car for now with the stock ECU, and it's going to be providing a narrowband output. So what I have uh, is the little bit of um, different solution. Uh, a lot of people go for the Innovate or the AEM wideband solutions. And I decided to go with this company. It's by 14.7, the point is spelled out, uh, .com. And they make a open source uh, Lambda sensor. So uh, you use it with the regular Bosch 4.9 revision O2 sensors that they put out that, that, you know, that everybody uses. Um, all the same manufacturers use this exact same sensor. And uh, I got the one that was like just pre put together. Um, I like the packaging, the fact that, you know, it, it actually comes with a two year warranty as opposed to one year warranty that you get. And it's really cheap. Um, the whole thing is like 125, including the sensor. So um, you can, you know, get a fully functional sensor, uh, you know, for not that much money. And um, it's really compact, as you can see. Um, and basically the O2 sensor is replaceable. Um, you could wire in, you could get this separately. I think, I don't think it's coded in any way to the, to the device or something. I think you could probably wire it in, but you could also just get it plug and play, you know, from 14.7 and just, you know, get a new one for a little bit of a markup. It's, it, I think it ends up being like about 25 bucks extra than what you would pay for this on like Amazon or something, but seems like a good unit. And one of the things that annoyed me, uh, well, I got, a, I got, I went with this for two reasons. One, I wanted a completely different gauge. I didn't like the AM offering. I didn't like the innovate offering. Um, I, I was going for a particular look and they didn't have it. So the second thing was, you know, you could innovate has a nice one. Well, I guess they both do, um, where they, they have a standalone system, uh, which doesn't have a gauge or does not require a gauge. And then you can add your own gauge to it. Um, and the gauges that I got, which are from speedhut.com, they can be customized. You know, you buy them and you specify the, the, um, sensor that you're using. So in this case, I specified Spartan 2, uh, which is the, the 14.7.com sensor uh, or controller. And, um, um, but you can specify for AEM or Innovate or, you know, the bigger manufacturers. Um, but the problem was the, the cost was a lot higher. It was like a hundred bucks more. I think if you added everything together with the gauge that I wanted and then Innovate kind of cheaped out in the recent ones, the LC2, is the one from Innovate, which is standalone. It's probably about the same size and everything, but they kind of went a different route as far as what the wiring goes. They decided to dumb it down, I think, and they have like a single ground for both the sensor and the heater, which doesn't seem like a great idea. I mean, from an electronics, just a pure electronics standpoint, um, that's kind of dumb because the heater draws a lot of power and it can be noisy and you really don't want that uh, noise on the same line, ground line, as an interfering with your signal to um, the electronics. So you want that ground to be the exact same ground as your um, as where your ECU is and uh, you don't want to be introducing that noise to the rest of your ECU components as well. That could screw up other sensors in the car and just be 
kind of a constant nightmare. Um, so this one comes with two grounds. You know, it has what the LC1 had, which is is basically an electronics ground and a heater ground. Um, that's what that's what this uh, white and black wire are. So uh, I don't know. All that combined, I thought, hey, I'll try it. You know, I'll I'll, I'll give it a shot. Uh, so the way this works, especially in the Miata, is I'm just going to plug this in, uh, you know, in the, in the exhaust, the normal, basically stock location. I have custom headers on there that came with the car, but um, it's more or less the stock location. So in mine, I have these custom headers, and um, right down there is where the O2 sensor came out. And... Um, uh, and it came out with no problems whatsoever. Um, basically, this is my setup. I've got a O2 sensor socket, and a, I could just do a straight shot directly into there, and you can see the hole right there. Um, and so it came out with like almost no torque at all. In fact, it was a little under torqued. Um, so I'm kind of concerned that it was like they couldn't get enough angle on it or something whoever did this before and uh didn't uh didn't torque it down but that's the old one so i'm going to be reusing this connector and what i've done is i've just double checked that the connector um is wiring the same way as i think it should be based on the manual and it's a little bit hard to see this wiring but because everything's kind of dirty but uh, basically, there's a black with a yellow stripe that's the black one that's on top. Just below it is a red, um, or actually, no, just above it, red and blue striped. The, and the one below it is the, um, the black with yellow. Black with yellow is power. Red with blue is a signal. And then um, the other two are the grounds. One's the heater ground and one is the... Um, a sensor ground and so you don't want to get those mixed up so what you want to do is if your wiring is is a different cut set of colors coming out of the pins and mine is a different set of colors then you want to make sure you know which and mine has the two grounds being the same color which makes it great you don't want to get those mixed up it's actually a good idea to keep those separate uh, for reasons I discussed in the last video and um, um, so we're gonna cut this and then we're gonna test it um, so that for continuity to see which one is which and then we're gonna mark the one uh, at this end to make sure that uh, we have the we have the right the right grounds so that these are gonna wire up correctly so I've set up a little chart just to keep things straight. And basically you got the four wires that you're working with, plus on the Spartan you've got the green wire that's coming out that's gonna be going to the gauge input, which is yellow. So um, that's kind of off to the side. But we've got our switch power, and on the vehicle itself coming out of the wiring harness, um, it's black yellow on this version of Miata. This is a 94, it should apply to the 95s. Potentially all the um, 1.8 NAs will have the same coloring, but um, you may want to verify that for yourself. And then the cable that it connects to the O2 sensor, the generic one that I that I took off, I snipped that, and it's kind of a generic um, cable. It doesn't use the same coloring scheme or whatever, and so there are two black wires, which um, make it a little annoying. Um, because they're not both ground or anything like that. They're, they're two completely different things. So um, they just have to be lined up in the, in the right way. So I put that on there as well. Switch power is one of the black ones with white, which I labeled with white. And I just kind of marked it with a, with a paint pen. And then we've got the other black wires, the heater, ground. And the sensor is the blue, which is typical on these. And the sensor ground 
is the white wire. And then, then we're going to move it across. That's what's going to be soldered together with the Spartan 2. So let's uh, strip these wires off and we'll get some soldering in. All right, so for this, um, we can get this uh, part of the um, connection wrapped up before we actually plug in the thing because normally you may have to, um, on an O2 sensor replacement, you'd have to install the O2 sensor because you don't want those wires to twist first and then get it connected. Um, and if they're soldering, then you have to do your soldering last. But um, this makes it kind of easy because I could do most of the soldering outside the engine bay, which is nice. Um, I guess that's one benefit of it not going through the uh, console there is that um, I could do it uh, here on the bench. So um, what I like to do, I didn't, so since I have such open space and stuff and it's easier to film, um, last time I didn't really talk about exactly how I connected these two. And so what I did was a lineman splice. Um, and basically you start off by stripping uh, a good bit of the insulation off give yourself you know a, a, about an inch and the reason for that is that you're going to be twisting these wires together in a, in a very specific way and it's going to make a connection both physically and electronically um, throughout the on both sides and it's going to be a pretty broad nice and broad connection and so a lot of connectivity and then the solder is there to basically meld it all together and have it stay put. So um, this is basically how they do wiring, you know, uh, that needs to be under stress, but it's also the, one of the best ways to ensure that you're not going to have a problem, uh, you know, due to vibration, due to, you know, just different things um, that could happen in the engine bay. So um, this is a good way to do it. All right, so I've done this first power one. The power, according to my handy chart, switch power is, we really care about the cable part now to the Spartan. So the power is gonna be the, the um, on the cable is the black with white, which is this one right here. And what I did was, um, you're basically, you take this little L and you, you, you put, you connect, one going down and one going up. And then what's gonna happen is they're gonna twist. If you can see that. One of them's gonna twist around the other going this direction. And the other one's gonna twist around the other coming back uh, that direction. And so they've got a hook in the middle where they meet and that provides protection from any kind of stresses or pulling or anything like that, um, which is gonna be further supported by the solder. But then you've got ideally three revolutions on either side of, you can tell better with this one because it's, uh, it's copper and the other one's kind of an aluminum or something like that, and uh, wiring. And um, so you go, you twist around each one on each side so you got these twists you can tell the copper is around the cable side and then you've got the cable side twisting around the copper which is the power side which goes to this little inline fuse that they recommend so we're going to do that so there's a little extra solder right there so i've slid down um, some little uh shrink uh tubing heat shrink and then so we've got that, and then we'll be able to apply that solder and then slide the tubing back over. Okay. So then we got a nice amount of solder flowed into everything. Of course, you want to heat from the bottom or from the opposite side. And um, heat from down here. So it come, I put the place my tip like right here, and then I fed solder in from the top. So it's flowing through it's gonna to flow towards the highest heat. So it's gonna to flow towards the bottom and make sure that it gets the entire thing. So we let that cool off just a little bit and then we can slide our heat shrink up and we're done with that joint. So we got this back in. Um, can't see it in this light, but you can kind of see the reflectiveness of it. Uh, 
this one was a lot longer than a regular O2 sensor. So this one, this uh, socket didn't work, but luckily I have one of these as well. Um, it basically goes on like this and it's real low profile. And so tried to torque it down uh, to about 30 foot pounds, th between 30 and 40, um, which I think should be sufficient. It's a little hard to tell because it has NACs and that messes up the torque. This messes up the torque. And this messes up the torque. So basically, I did it by feel. So I torqued it down to whatever I felt like. So not too tight. And we fished this yellow wire through the firewall. That's with a little grommet that I use for my other gauge, um, my pressure gauge. And just kind of fish this through with a little piece of wire here. This is just a mark flag, but you could use a coat hanger or whatever. Um, or however it makes sense to, to push it through. In my case, I already had the gauge in the car, so I didn't want to take everything out and push it through the other way. Um, so we'll do that. And then that's what is going to connect to the remaining wire on the, uh, on the unit, which is the green wire. All right, it's idling. So what this little blue LED means is uh, it's uh, will blink uh, too, it'll blink fast if it's uh, too hot and it'll blink slow if it's too cool. So indeed it blinked slow when it was, when I just started the car. And then, so it's idling right now, it's idling a little bit I would say just a tad rougher than normal. And you can see the, uh, it's bouncing around a little bit. I'd say this is a little lean. I mean, it's it's basically right at 14 points. It's kind of bouncing around 14.7, which is what a narrow band output does. You know, it kind of bounces around 14.7. Um, that's not to say the gauge is narrow band. The gauge is getting the full wide band readout. What the ECU is getting is the narrow band output, which should be zero to one volt. Um, and I mean, it looks like it's basically working. There was a little bit of roughness uh, at, right at the start, a little bit more than what we hear now. Um, still just a tad, I would say, It's like leaning out and then going super rich. Um, so I have to take it around for a drive to kind of see how it does under load um, because that's kind of a different situation than just idling and revving in the driveway. Looks like we're done, so I'll continue to play with it, monitor, make sure everything's still good. Next step is going to be to uh, actually build the mega squirt so we'll be having continue our series of videos on that so uh stay tuned we're going to get that fully soldered up i'll be very detailed about all that and then we will get it in the car and uh, start testing thanks a lot thanks for watching